All right, well, today, uh, finish up War of the Roses, and we'll talk about the Renaissance, one of the seminal events in uh, intellectual history of the West. We're going to talk about such figures as Niccolo, Machiavelli, some of the great artists and thinkers, uh, Italian Renaissance humanism as a concept, Northern Renaissance humanism, the Reformation, figures as John Huss, Martin Luther, the Counter Reformation, Charles V, Pope Paul III, Pope Paul IV. Council of Trent and Yate, and look at the Spanish unification. All right. We didn't quite get a chance to finish off uh, the uh, Four of the Roses last time. Do you want to have a copy of the Four of the Roses handout? We talked about the years of difficult civil war that headed the House of Lancaster against the House of York. Bloodshed, intrigue, backstabbing that makes the Game of Thrones story look tame. That was actually, was in many ways, the inspiration for it. So we've gotten through. Uh, the death of Edward the through Edward the Fourth and uh, Henry the Sixth, and everything had pretty much calmed down to this point. Henry the Fourth was gone. And you got Edward the Fourth on the throne. Edward the Duke of York, former Duke of York. But he had a brother named Richard. Um, younger brother, a very ambitious, very shrewd, very calculating, very jealous. While Edward was spending bulk of the time uh, fighting, uh, year, those years fighting uh, Henry the Sixth, um, Richard was actually acting as governor of many of these areas in northern England that uh, the Yorkists had under control, helping to organize the uh, manpower, resources, and finances to keep uh, the Yorkist claim alive. But because Edward was the oldest, he inherited the, the claim, and he became king. So Richard, extremely upset over that, very bitter over it. But Edward, even though he's a fairly uh, young man of a young family, uh, his health declines uh, and dies in 1483. But now comes his son, Edward V. Edward V was born in 1470 during the uh, flight of the Yorkists from London. Uh, Edward V's life is short and tragic. When his father, Edward IV, was restored to the throne, Edward was made Prince of Wales, basically the heir to the throne. And upon his father's death in April 1483, Edward becomes king. He's 12 years old. He's a bright, intelligent young man, uh, very likable. But he's still only 12 years old. Richard sees his chance. In fact, still some questions over Edward's death. I'm not quite sure why he died, why this strong and vital leader suddenly just health seemed to decline so precipitously. A lot of people suspect poisoning. Well, now you have Edward V, Edward's son, Richard's nephew. Well, Edward IV's ministers were acting as regents for Edward V, helping, uh, making decisions for the kingdom, running the kingdom, helping train Edward how to be an effective and able king. But Richard thought that should be his position. So Richard 
Um, ranges charges of treason against uh, Edward's regents, claiming they are uh, destroying England, that they are defiling the throne, they're leading England astray. So he has uh, Edward's regents removed and has himself put in that place. But he's uh, still, but he's only one step away from the throne. So close he can taste it. And all standing the way is a 12 year old boy, his 10 year old brother. Well, by June, just two months after Edward had taken the throne, Richard convinces Parliament that the births of Edward and his brother, Richard of Shrewsbury, were illegitimate. On the grounds that Edward IV's previous marriage was still in effect when he married their mother, uh, Elizabeth Woodville, a prominent noble family, but uh, Richard said that uh, annulment had not gone through. That uh, technically, the two that Edward was still married to fourth was still married to his first wife, Edward V and Richard Shrewsbury, therefore illegitimate. Therefore, an adulterous relationship out of wedlock, therefore, cannot claim the throne. So, Richard has both Edward and Richard kicked off the throne. Edward's deposed, he has them both sent to the Tower of London. Now, the Tower, all sorts of things happen there. It is, uh, sometimes it's just a holding area for uh, VIP uh, prisoners. Sometimes there have been uh, tortures and murders in there. Sometimes just an extension of the royal palace. But essentially, a 12 year old boy and a 10, his 10 year old brother and have prisoners there under guard, waiting whatever fate their uncle decides. The Tower of what? Tower of London. Among many other places. So the Queen's got a lot of jewelry. Joe's so carrying around the little purse. <laughs> but um, Edward and Richard, Richard, Edward has been deposed, Richard has been arrested along with them. Now their uncle is on the throne. But what were the grounds for their arrest? Like what? Okay, I understand that they were born born out of wedlock, but is that illegal? No. But uh, legally, in England, they had committed no crime. It's basically, Parliament denied their claim to the throne. Okay. Off. For Richard, their crime is standing in his way. Basically, being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Potential rivals for his throne. Edward V is 12 years old in 1483, but fast forward 10 years, he get a lot of people behind him. Maybe enough to topple. Basically, he's sitting in terror of what a 10, 12 year old boy could do to him one day. Add to the fact the mysterious uh, circumstances around, rumors surrounding his father's death. Shakespeare wrote a play about the life and reign of Richard III, probably one of the most despicable characters in Shakespearean literature. You know, for good reason. A lot of Shakespeare's histories are very close to what actually happened. But Richard deals with his enemies ruthlessly. Um, sinister, calculating figure. In spite of this, in spite of all he does, he actually still has defenders still to the day. Of course, Hitler still has defenders, too. Mm. Did I say that? Yes, I said that. Mm. Uh -huh. Well, Richard uh, had accused advisors and plotters of trying to assassinate Edward V, even though Richard now has, his, has the throne. 
and now he's moving ruthlessly to eliminate any possible opposition to him. Assassinations, uh, charges of treason, mysterious deaths and disappearances, all strengthening Richard's position. Well, after Edward and Richard are taken to the Tower of London, they are never seen again. Presumed murdered on Richard's orders, because nothing's going to happen in the Tower without the King's knowing or consent. They never found out what happened. They weren't presumed after all the reports of uh, their health and well-being end that's dead. Never found the bodies, but 200 years later, last parts of the 17th or 18th century, they found the bodies, two young boys, sealed up in the walls of the tower. Presumably, King Edward, Prince Richard, no DNA test back then but there was only one conclusion of who it could have been those are the only two children who had ever been in the Tower of London Richard had them murdered and sealed up their bodies in the wall they're given state funerals still to this day no DNA test has been done on the remains but it's assumed they probably were them but again we go back to this Tower of London. Nothing happened that Richard's knowledge or consent. These are his nephews. They are under army guard. People reported directly to him and only to him. He killed two children. So they could be king. Well, he's widely hated. But why kill them? He was, they were already out of his way. Because you're thinking like a rational, moral person. Right. That's not Richard III. Uh, Richard III lives in the shadows. He jumps to shadows. He's convinced everyone's out to get him because they are. <laughs> he sees what they could become, what they symbolize. As long as they're alive, they're a symbol of opposition to him. They're a potential replacement for Richard. Richard has daughters. He has no sons. He has two live claimants to the throne that Richard deposed and murdered a lot of people to get rid of. They could threaten him when they could threaten him. Richard is terrified of what it could be. All he wants is power and will destroy whoever it takes to do it, including killing two children to do it. Well, um, the brief rebellion against his rule erupted in 1483. Uh, latter part of 1483 is quickly crushed, but he knew mutinies and rebellions were simmering everywhere. So under this entered Henry Tudor. He had been a supporter of the Lancaster faction. Uh, after that, after a uh, the loss and the death of uh, Henry the Sixth. He'd been exiled in France. 1485, Henry comes back to um, England with an army he had raised to face Richard. At the Battle of Bosworth Field in 1485, Henry defeats Richard. Richard dying in battle, supposedly his last words, and muttering over and over again, treason, treason. Richard was not buried on the spot. Turns out centuries later, it was the side of a park. He was buried underneath it, what would become a parking lot. <laughs> How appropriate. Yeah. A few years ago, they had discovered his body. They, they were digging up the parking lot, trying to expand it a little bit, and uh, they discovered his body in there. So they reburied it with the state honors. Uh, 
But his cousin, Henry Tudor, becomes King Henry VII. He'll rule till his son comes to the throne, Henry VIII. So they have the Tudor dynasty. So the Tudor becomes the seventh? Yep. Because you're, you're, uh, when you become king, you don't use your last name. You, uh, your number becomes whatever number of what that name is when you come to the throne. How many previous Henrys have been to the throne? He's the seventh Henry. Richard was the third Richard. And these, so, and these were all descendants of Edward the third. Yeah. These are all Plantagenets. Uh, all the Plantagenet descendants. Henry the Eighth will kill the last of the Plantagenet claimants. All the Plantagenet cousins. Because he's obsessed. Henry the Eighth will be obsessed over a, a clear line of the throne. Because Henry the Seventh, he's the last English king to, say, to seize the crown on the field of battle. All the others have had it inherited or a parliament has offered it to them. But the Civil War between the Yorks and the Lancasters, the Tudors win. But to show that uh, unity, the, uh, you have the, uh, the crest of the Tudor family, Tudor soldiers always wear is called the Tudor robes. And the white robes for the, uh, um, the uh, white robes for the Yorkists, the, yellow, the red robes for the Lancastrians, and so you have the combined red and white robes for the, uh, the Tudors showing the two factions unified. It was a very bloody, very messy affair. But all this is happening during the Renaissance. The Renaissance uh, comes to war meaning rebirth. It's a rebirth of learning, of ideas, of thinking, of education. The world is throwing away its shackles and fears from the Middle Ages, looking forward to the future again. Belief in human possibility. What we could accomplish with our minds, we just educated ourselves and threw away superstition and fear. We have this renewed interest in uh, Greco Roman philosophy, uh, science. Director Roman Art and Literature. So all of a sudden that's being discovered all these old monasteries that locked up for centuries. Like the floodgates been opened, it's all just rushing out across Europe, changing the way Europeans see themselves and the world, desire to learn more about the world. It flourishes especially in Italy. Italy I was doing very well towards the end of the Middle Ages. All the different city-states were uh, organizing as uh, their own little trade empires, making a ton of money off of the trade between Asia and the rest of Europe. They have all these families with a ton of money on their hands, and what do they want to do? They want to show it off. They want to pay great artists to be brilliant and uh, uh, paint great portraits of them. Uh, they want to patronize great learning, uh, uh, paying for the construction of buildings at universities, their names on it, the works. Um, so what you see overall is this renewed confidence in the abilities of man. It's contact with the Mid-Eastern Mid Arab scholars, uh, an expanding trade region was helping. So they have this renewed interest in uh, education and exploration. They want to learn about the world now. Perhaps the best epitomized by a uh, whole period of uh, in the words of the Florentine architect Leon Battista Alberti. Alberti said, uh, Men can do all things if they will. Men can do all things if they will. I believe there were no limits on human ability. They had this uh, economic recovery going on for some time. I have, particularly through uh, the Venetian Flanders fleet. As people sail from Venice along the coast of the Mediterranean up to uh, northern Europe, cutting a lot of time and expense off of uh, traveling overland. The Flanders fleet's making a ton of money. A lot of people heavily invested in that. 
In Northern Europe, you have what's called the Hanseatic League. Basically, a trade organization. Uh, mostly at northern German cities. By 1500, you had 80 cities belonging to this. Essentially, just a vast trade network. Well, Italy was hit hard by the plague, but the, the Hanseatic League continued to prosper. But long term, the Black Death proved to be just kind of more of a blip on the radar for the trade for Italy and the northern Germany. Like I said, numbers and uh, profits were reduced in the short term, but uh, were bound eventually for the long term. In the city of Florence, you have the Medici family. Extraordinarily wealthy, they restored the city's uh, um, strength and the prestige in the 15th century. Made the money off the banking. Now, of course, charging money for interest was illegal, so how did the Medici make money off the banking? Very simple. Differences in the value of current, different currencies in different countries. Like I said, currencies are going, values are going up or down compared to. Uh, uh, relative to uh, your own country. So what the Medici family did was they loan you money in one type of currency and demand repayment in another. Type to be earning them more money. And they made a fortune off of that. And so they pretty much controlled Italian banking in the 14th century. They pretty much paid for uh, everything, everything Florence needed. So, uh, what ends up happening is a shifting around of uh, the social classes. Because of this new trade, because of all the deaths from the Black Plague, everything, the, all the deck chairs basically have been rearranged. Now, among the nobles, you have a new nobility emerging, still just 2 to 3 percent of the population, but uh, you have all these people making all this new money off all this uh, trade stuff. So, the dominating society and important government and military posts. In some cases, they are granted titles for their service. Sometimes they bought these titles as a bribe of the local prince or king. And sometimes um, they bought it from a, a destitute noble. So when it's desperate to pay the bills, they had no money, they just bought the title and took it over. But you have this new generation of uh, nobles. They really don't know quite how to uh, act as nobles. So. You have books that are trying to change it. The book of the court here. That is, a book on etiquette it was very popular in 1528. The Handbook of European Aristocrats. And the book of the court here emphasized that nobles must have good character, cultivate great achievements, as a patron of learning or on the, uh, yourself on the battlefield, and also have a classical education. <laughs> Be educated, be refined, be a person of some accomplishments, either through your own philanthropy or through your own military achievements. Now, the peasants, that's still 85 to 90 percent of the population, depending on where you're at. You have the rest of clergy. You have a decline in serfdom generally across Europe, especially in the West, and you have increasing urbanization happening. More people moving to the cities, more opportunities. And what's happening is, out of these peasants, you have a new middle class emerging. People who are of a more means, able to support themselves, or uh, apply trade. People who are not uh, desperately poor could feed themselves, not have to be beggars, but except, had a very reasonable standard of living. But also, you have an aristocracy emerging. Especially as the different social class sorts start settling out among the peasants. You have these upper middle classes, uh, the nobles intermingling, this kind of aristocracy emerging. And so you look at the family structure this time. Remember Romans, the old Potter Familius system, that is the father centered family. It hadn't changed much in the past thousand, the previous thousand years. 
In the 1400s, an Italian father's authority over his children is absolute until his death or until he formally frees the children. That is, you had to do exactly what your father said. Control your uh, career, your property, everything. In fact, a judge would formally have to emancipate children. Not, wouldn't automatically turn 18 or 21 to his, until the father or judge says so. How would the judge be able to do that? Basically, they just uh, listen to the reasons of uh, both sides. Uh, usually, father and son coming to an arrangement, saying, "Okay, it's time. Uh, you're formally emancipated." Or, Why do they have to be emancipated? It's just their tradition, because remember, it's the father-centered family. Uh, Father's authority is absolute. So then, whenever the kid gets old enough, or they think it's time, yeah. then the kid gets emancipated, so he can go and be the center of. Yeah. So he can be the patriarch, or uh, he can go off and uh, strike out in his own of the world, accomplish his own things. And so that can be, at this point, from the early teens to the late 20s. But, uh, Bob, you do exactly what your father says. Make you think your own man's tough. The wife managed the household. Uh, but the upper class women, though, are frequently pregnant because their job is to produce the next generation of aristocrats. So basically, the job of women is basically to be barefoot pregnant. Very limited role. The problem, though, is about 10% of women died in childbirth. All sorts of complications, uh, the pregnancy and the delivery, uh, that's a massive hemorrhaging, post uh, postpartum infections, just all sorts of other things going wrong. So conditions that would be easily treated today, but they know how to take care of it. But the reason why they had had so many kids was they had very high uh, mortality rates. In Florence in the 1400s, 50 percent of children born to merchant families died before the age of 20. It's half your kids aren't going to make to adulthood. So large families were a survival mechanism. But of course you have problems with, on page 348, the territories in Italy are small, basically city-states. It's the city and the surrounding areas, but they're controlling very valuable uh, trade routes. So what ends up happening is you have all these commercial uh, trade wars. wars were very costly, very expensive, mostly between Venice and Milan. Florence had jumped in a lot, but mostly Florence and Venice and Milan. Venice is actually the most uh, powerful politically of all these groups. The thing is, though, they have small populations. Most of the population involved in other things, trade, the stuff, keeping, the, um, keeping these uh, communities prosperous. What do they do? They resort to Mercenaries. But of course, mercenaries are expensive. Like I say, remember, mercenaries, you're not buying their oil, so you're only renting it. And rent is very high. The problem is these cost of wars, these high expenses, they stabilize a lot of these societies. There's so much of this wealth going instead of uh, people going to these mercenary armies. In fact, so much so, by the end of the 1400s, early 1500s, these uh, major powers in northern northern Italy aren't nearly as powerful as they had been before. Southern Italy is becoming dominated by uh, uh, the Spanish and the French. Uh, 1527, the Spanish under King Charles IV, King Charles I sacked Rome. First time since uh, the Vandals, but uh, Rome has been sacked this time by the Spanish king. Spain being the dominant power in central and southern Italy for years after. Yes, that's interesting figures is this man. 351. Niccolò Machiavelli. 
synonymous with sinister politician, the cynicism and ruthlessness of politics, but wrote an important uh, book called The Prince in 1530. And basically, this is a guidebook of how to acquire and maintain power. He actually based it off of an actual person. Basically, Machiavelli, an otherwise thoughtful man, um, Basically, what he does is he writes down what everyone knows and thinks. He's the first one to actually put this on words. How princes acquire and maintain power. Uh, among other things, arguing that well, it is better for a ruler to be feared rather than loved. And his model was a man named Cesare Borgia. He is the son of Pope Alexander VI. Pope Alexander VI. Mm -hmm. yeah, yes, the popes are supposed to be celibate. The priests are supposed to be celibate. Somehow, Al Alexander Borgia didn't exactly get that memo. <laughs> but so many of the bishops and cardinals who elected him for that throne had their own kids, so they couldn't really say much. But Cesare, um, ruthlessly carved out a, a state in central Italy, basically seized military control of the papal states, uh, and used Borgia as the example of how to acquire and maintain power. In fact, a couple of Alexander's sons ended up becoming very powerful figures in uh, Italy for quite a long time. Cesare is going to die at uh, a young age, power dying with him, but his other sons are going to. Uh, very powerful figure in southern Italy, uh, at least a couple of small cities, uh, his descendants for the next couple hundred years. But now let's look at what he says here on page 353. This leads us then to a question that is in dispute. Is it better to be loved than feared, or vice versa? My reply is one ought to be both loved and feared. But since it is difficult to accomplish both at the same time, I maintain that it is safer to be feared than loved. For what of men one can in general say this. They are ungrateful, fickle, deceptive, and deceiving, avoiders of danger, eager to gain. As long as you serve their interests, they are devoted to you. They promise you their blood, their possessions, their lives, and their children, as I said before, so long as you seem to have no need of them. But as soon as you need help, they turn against you. Any ruler who simply relies on their promises, makes no other preparations, will be destroyed. For you find that those who support you by do not rally to you because they admire your strength, the character, and nobility of soul. These are people you pay for, but they're never yours. In the end, you can never get, reap the benefit of your bargain. Men are less nervous of offending someone who makes himself lovable than someone who makes himself frightening. For love attaches men by ties of obligation, which since men are wicked, they break whenever their interests are at stake. But fear restrains men because they are afraid of punishment. And uh, this fear never leaves them. Still, a ruler should not make himself feared in such a way that if he is, did not inspire love, at least he does not provoke hatred. For it's perfectly possible to be feared and not hated. You only be hated if you seize the property or the women of your subjects and citizens. Whenever you kill someone, make sure you have a suitable excuse and an obvious reason. But above all else, keep your hands off other people's property. For men are quicker to get the death of their father than the loss of their inheritance. Moreover, there are always reasons why you might want to seize people's property, and he begins to live by plundering others, or find an excuse for seizing other people's possessions. But there are fewer reasons for killing people, and one killing need not lead to another. And rulers that head his army and has a vast number of soldiers at his command is absolutely essential to be prepared to be thought cruel. For it is impossible to keep an army united and ready for action without requiring the reputation of cruelty. So what do you think about that? <laughs> a lot of politicians have read this since then. <laughs> Obviously, Richard didn't read this too well. <laughs> so, Provoked hatred. Property and monetary... 
uh, materials are more important than family and all that. So you're a politician. Uh, so you're a politician, there are only two types of people, tools and enemies? Pretty much. Pretty much. John F. Kennedy once said, uh, keep your friends close, but keep your enemies closer. So we would put it as the part of the cycle in a lab, like, the battery or the world. Well, uh, he had a pretty good feel of human nature overall, I think, or at least a very cynical view of it. But uh, I'd say part of a pretty good analysis of Borgia as a character, uh, I'd say so. But what do you think about his uh, opinions on human nature? Is he right? Is he wrong? Is he a little too cynical? Too one-sided. Too one-sided? Not objective. Not objective. I think of his idea that uh, people forgive the death of their father before they give the, forgive the uh, loss of their inheritance. Do you think uh, that's true? Uh, maybe back home. Okay. Yeah, maybe back home not. Kind of depends. Mm-hmm. How much you want power. Yeah. Because one thing you do have to understand in human nature is until there's money involved, you don't have, know how people really are. We assume uh, a ruler is going to want to work maintain power. It has to do it by being tough, not necessarily cr- not necessarily cruel. Okay. Uh, I'm saying somebody's hated, but someone is going to have to exercise power and use that power to stay in power. Okay. Human rights in the 16th century are not a priority, especially for a guy like uh, Machiavelli describing his analysis of Borgia. So if you want to keep power, or that kind of power, you're not going to be a nice guy. You can be loved, but you have to make hard decisions sometimes. You have to bring down the hammer, yeah? Yeah. Okay, I think that's pretty, that's pretty accurate. Yeah. You don't have to be lying, you just have to, you know. Say it on the bed, is that a great, what is it, great job, I feel like that? Yes, uh, there are a lot of other kind of examples like this around the, uh, around the time period of, so remember, this is not an age of democracy or representative government, even though some countries are trying at very primitive levels, but the real power is with the crown. And growing up in that time period, they tended to admire strong rulers. And they admire the mongers. Yeah, I think so. It's a... Uh, I say, if uh, you're ruling in this kind of environment, for Machiavelli, that's how you rule. I said, Machiavelli's own uh, nature. He's not passing judgment to say, this is how it's done. I say, you can be feared and loved at the same time. It's hard to do, but if you want to stay in power, it's safer to be feared and loved. Actually, a cruel man, it's easier to show mercy than it is for a uh, merciful man to show cruelty. So that's Machiavelli. Hmm. But now we look in some detail here at the Renaissance itself. Important handout here. I said, keep this one handy. I say that in handy. This is things. Study this for the exam, among many other things. For our final. Yeah. That'll be not the week after we get back, but uh, the week after that. First full week of December. Wednesday. What's that? You said after we come back. No, not after we come back. Uh, Monday after we get back, so we're going to have that quiz on uh, chapter 11. The week after that is final exam week. 
So we get one more week of regular class time after we get back from Thanksgiving. Okay. Thank you. And we have our final exam schedule. Our exam this class will be the Wednesday after uh, that about that week, first full week of December, I think like the 8th. Actually, I'll get you all the schedules and everything on that. But let us look at uh, this. Uh, Italian Renaissance Humanism. One of the key ideas of the uh, Renaissance. It's a movement based on the study of classical works. Um, they studied what can be called the liberal arts. That's where you get to the term humanism from. Early 4th century, a uh, Roman scholar named Marcus Capella uh, compiled all the uh, uh, fields of study someone even know to be educated in the seven distinct fields that came to be called the liberal arts. Those are the standard fields that have been studied ever since that time. They included astronomy, rhetoric, music, history, uh, and so forth, uh, literature. Basically, to be fully versed in those was to be fully educated. Well, the Italians now, in this period of Renaissance humanism, They've uncovered the liberal arts and they are devouring them. Um, excitement about work. This is all based on these old Greco Roman writers. This is a time period in which artists flourish because they've now studied Greco Roman artistic styles. How to be a good artist, how to withdraw well. Um, figure Petrarch was among the most important. Petrarch described uh, the intellectual life as uh, one of constant solitude. It is to study, it's often it's an individual effort. So I'm going to school, I can tell you how many, can't tell you how many hours I spent in the dungeons of uh, the library having to pour through uh, old journals for reports and to study for exams. So that is the life of learning and be educated, training your mind. But the humanists overall believe that education, um, particularly the liberal arts and so forth, they believe are the key to individual freedom. That is, you cannot free yourself from superstition, fear, ignorance. You cannot unlock potential in you unless you have an education. There is no other way. I say your charm is only going to get you so far. Your looks, they will fade in time. That is, you have to have a mind to propel you forward. I believe that an educated person, educated in logic, educated in rhetoric, morality, ancient studies, that will produce an intelligent and virtuous person. Someone not only knows the difference between right and wrong, but understands it and can explain it to others. However, though, this time it's still mostly all just for men. Women usually aren't allowed into these human schools or universities. But there were some daughters of some wealthy merchants who were given tutors who have some grounding to the basics in the liberal arts. Still, though, it's meant just for men only. Now, look at some of these figures here. Let's look at some of the differences in the painting and so forth. We'll have a couple up here. Example here, at page uh, 349. It's a very bright, vibrant colors. It's a sharp backgrounds. It looks like a three-dimensional image. I go back to page 326. This uh, drawing in a book here uh, of Pope Boniface VIII from the early 1300s. It looks like a bunch of cartoon figures. They don't look like the real people. Like yeah, face is all smushed. Everything's out of proportion. So they don't look like real what people. Do they look yeah. Mm -hmm. That's exactly. Just little things just don't seem to make a lot of sense. I'll go back a little further here. Go to page three thirteen. You see this uh, drawing of the peasant revolt in uh, France, the Jacquerie. 
He has some people there who are two stories tall. Huh. It didn't work like that. And then everything's all twisted and out of proportion. Uh, except very bad drawings. Except the bodies don't seem to work naturally. But now you get into a Piero de Villa Francesca. Uh, the portrait of Machiavelli here in 351 of uh, Santi de Tito. Except Machiavelli here looks like a real person. Except the clothing they wore is kind of padded, kind of stuffy. They made it look a little bigger than what they were, but, uh, but this looks like a real person looking at you. Everything's in perfect proportion. The women that they did, they all look so pale when they do that, you know, because they got big powders that they're on. Uh, this was the time period when uh, they generally wore, did try to look paler because people with tans were people who worked outside. Pale was in then. Yeah. On into the <laughs> on into the 1700s, pale was the thing. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, Elizabeth I uh, to cover up her age when she got older. Uh, she wore these uh, these yarn wigs. Make look her hair is still young and orange and. Uh, had this uh, makeup on her all the time that uh, really just destroyed her skin underneath. That's kind of what they wore back then. Of course, kind of locked herself into it. She couldn't take off the makeup because real how bad she, how bad her skin had aged. But it aged because of the makeup too. Because of the makeup too, made it even worse. Actually, just. Uh, So basically, makeup was uh, it evolved over time. It's been tested thoroughly. It wasn't really tested back then. Basically, you're looking for the look of the 16th, 15th, and 16th century. And they really didn't think about the health of the skin very much. Yeah. Didn't understand why skin ages, why it changes over time. What was it made? Yeah, some lead powder, and uh, some of it had uh, all sorts of other toxic chemicals and everything. Just basically looking for the look. So what even worse is that uh, people of northern European descent, very pale looking, shows damage to the skin a lot easier. So, so that's why, uh, you know, let's be honest here about uh, race. Whites age horribly. Oh. <laughs> it's because the skin is lighter and the flaws of the skin show up a lot easier. So wrinkles show up easier, blemishes, scars show up a lot easier. Uh, people living in different parts of the world, it's a little harder to tell their ages, at least from a European perspective, because the aging process is different. Like say, and, uh, well, people are, tend to be very vain no matter where they are, and uh, women applying makeup. Uh, they put a lot of things on their skin that damage their skin and uh, accelerated that aging process just out of vanity. Uh, say, and those uh, styles change over time. For example, look here on page 365. This woman's wearing here uh, uh, Van Eyck's uh, portrait of Jaren Fanny Arlofini, his bride. That was the height of fashion at that time period. These long, flowing dresses skirting on the ground, thick, heavy head dressings. What's her, what's her hair doing? Uh, basically, it's part of the head. It's all kind of hidden oh. underneath the, okay. the wimple. Makes a head dressing were very common at this time period. Uh, let's skip forward a little bit. Say. So, uh, 568, and seeing these aristocratic uh, images from the 17th century. Women had these very, uh, had these tight corsets on them, uh, basically kind of squeezed their organs a little bit, but these very wide dresses, these hoop skirts, popular well into the mid 19th century. But, um, and for, go forward a little bit further.
at least women here on page 967 the 1980s in Europe. Most of them are not wearing pants. If they are, it's simply because it's cold outside. They're not wearing dresses. They're wearing pants. So. That's what people commonly wore uh, at the start of that time period. Right here, page 955. Seeing this woman running here in Bosnia. It's a horrible scene, but uh, notice what she's wearing. It's a s simple blouse and skirt. Uh, skirt is raised up toward the knee. Styles change over time. Priorities change over time. And so most women in this class are wearing right now uh, jeans and t-shirts. Early 20th century, 70, 80, 100 years ago, y'all been arrested for obscenity. <laughs> but men's styles, though, stayed relatively they constant. They like and ponytails at one point, didn't they? Yeah, a pony, you had long hair back then, so he pulled back into a ponytail. That was the style. So, Mr. Cassidy is a, either ahead of his time or behind the times. <laughs> but... Uh, he didn't get haircuts very often, so he pulled it back into a ponytail. Yeah, he braided off. Sometimes it would, because the lighter look was better. That was the style of the time. Uh, back to go. Uh, compare styles today. There were styles in the 1980. Uh, women had these uh, overcoats that were, had these padded shoulders, trying to make them look more masculine, look like linebackers. <coughs> women hated them. Uh, parachute pants, uh, just... Think about yeah. the style it's, of facial hair. Exactly. It's just, it just looked very bad. <laughs> but that was what was popular at the time. What we see now, it's, people are going to look at us kind of funny in 30 years, too. Uh, but like you're saying, it's the changes over time. It's uh, priorities, interests, looks, the popular changes over time. And we live in an age where people are looking for things that are new and innovative. Uh, Sometimes facial hair is in style, sometimes it isn't. You'll see these long lines of kings with uh, facial hair, and then you see a long line without. Like I say, go through most of the mid 20th century. On professional men, you were clean shaven or just had a mustache. Like I said, the full beard was generally out of style not until the 19, late 1960s and the 1970s. It will come and go. I imagine people in the room are going to look around a lot because that fabric looks so heavy and they just wipe it down so much. It was very heavy. It was very thick. But, uh, like I said, it got very cold, but it did, did breathe fairly well in the summer. So wool was uh, breathing a little bit better. Like I said, men's fashion. So, what's that? Wool breathing? Like it's in a way, it does. It's, well, I mean, it's, I, I it's better it, than cotton. I know it doesn't breathe, literally. Yeah. I'm just saying... <laughs> That seemed like it would be very hot yeah. to wear. It was as thick, but as better than cotton the other thing they had at the time. So they could make it work well for the summertime. Um, like I said, we live in an age of synthetic fabrics where clothing is soft. It's not itchy. And, uh, like I say, you can pretty much throw on anything you feel fine with. So. Like I say, uh, like I say, hats, for example, up until the mid 20th century, made more hats. They don't make more. Probably because John F. Kennedy decided, I'm not wearing hats in public. It basically changed the fashion. Uh, but the uh, the basic style I'm wearing, uh, pants, jacket, some kind of neck decoration, that's been the style for men for professional style variations on it for more than 300 years. It's the color of the shirt I'm wearing, the style shirt, style necktie, or kind of lace uh, knot I'm wearing, would be wearing. That changes over time. Cufflinks. Like I said, those were invented because men wore these lace uh, shirts and they they want, didn't want the place to get damaged, so they'd cover it up or fold it up. But it's not really an issue, it's just basically it's tradition. Basically, how I'm dressed, it's basically how professional men are expected to dress. Some variation on this. Like say, in the next hundred years, 
it'll probably be something similar to this. The tie may be option, tie may be optional in some places, maybe maybe not, but it will definitely be some variation on this because that's just tradition. People like a certain look, and sometimes you do have to dress the parts. You don't have to wear a suit, though. Do you? I don't. No, no. I just like wearing one. Okay. <laughs> Except. Some businesses, they do, it is preferred. Uh, the college does not require male professors to wear a suit. Uh, some do, some don't. Dr. Claypool does a lot. Uh, that Professor Colbert has been here nearly 40 years. He can dress any way he wants to at this point. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, just sometimes it's a formal occasion, and uh, so I feel like I need to make an effort for you all. Mm -hmm. Next, I had this uh, professor in one of my English classes years ago. He, he's about 60 years old, long hair, uh, come slicked back. He'd a uh, pop belly. He'd come in there with a pair of ripped up blue jeans and a Washington Huskies t-shirt every class. <laughs> and I'm answering the question. The answer to the question, what does this all matter? <laughs> like I said, he's a very informal man, but... Uh, the way he presented himself, though, the facts he presented, students related to very well. He says facts were, uh, I said, people had a lot of respect for him because what he said was generally right. Uh, that mean I'm saying the wrong, I'm trying to make up for that? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just feel like it's kind of a little old fashioned, I think, that at least in this, at least in this respect, that. Uh, a professional man should put some effort into his appearance. And I, maybe when I'm 60 or 70, I might come into the ripped blue jeans and the Washington Huskies t shirt, but it's been okay. for now. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to art. <laughs> ars gratia artis. Latin means art for art's sake. But notice what, how these men are, how these paintings are changing. The people look real. Um, Example here of Michelangelo, Italian painter, sculptor, and architect, uh, painting on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel is going to be one of the uh, all-time uh, masterpieces. So what happens is, in the building of the Sistine Chapel, Pope Julius II commissioned the greatest artist he could find in Italy, Michelangelo, and basically said, "Just paint a do, uh, paint a masterpiece worthy of this new cathedral." And they had paintings on the ceiling. Each one of the panels in the uh, uh, ceiling had a scene from the Bible. Each one a masterpiece of itself. Uh, back when you go to the Sistine Chapel, you don't just go looking around here. They, they give you a mirror so you can look down and look at the reflection of it. Of course, you can't take pictures because the flash might damage the painting. But uh, uh, there should be. One up here. Okay, page 340, the creation of Adam. That's Michelangelo. Basically, God reaching out, touching Adam, creating him. That's the, that's the classical image we have. One story about Michelangelo's painting here from the Sistine Chapel is down here on the ground, he had the scene of his painting of, uh, finishing this one painting. It's a scene in hell trying to scare the people to remember finding them what they're trying to avoid. And while he's painting all of this, it's, this process takes years. Painting on the ceiling, he's laying down on his back on scaffolds, painting these while lying on his back. And this one scene, he's painting behind a curtain here. This little busybody cardinal keeps coming in, telling him what to do, criticizing it. To Michelangelo has his revenge. He paints the uh, cardinals, one of the demons of hell. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Cardinal sees it, he's up in a fury, uh, screaming at the Pope about this. He paints me as a demon in hell. Pope replies, uh, Well, as Pope, I can remove you from purgatory, but not from hell. <laughs> but uh, I said these look like real people, form, structure. Um, Michelangelo, the statue of David. Uh, 
So they look like real people. Muscle structure, a stance, it's, uh, look like something natural. But uh, look here at page uh, 361. Leonardo da Vinci, The Last Supper. Uh, and also look here at page 362, Raphael's School of Athens. Notice that everything is framed. Like you have a focal point for the, uh, for the paintings. Basically, everything trying to draw your attention right into it, especially with the, the Last Supper. The focal point is the image of Christ. And notice all the uh, figures, all the disciples either lean toward him or point toward him. And the doorway in the background kind of framing the whole thing. But notice in both paintings, the background gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Next day, it looks like a three-dimensional image, like it does in real life. Like you can just walk right into it. And that was the point they're trying to make. Structure, perspective, frame of reference, focal points. Professor Van Hoekel has a great class on this. She can tell you all about it in more detail than I can. But uh, these are some of the great figures of the Renaissance. Uh, Donatello, his uh, portrait of David here. Uh, uh, Raphael, the School of Athens. These are both influential painters and sculptors. Michelangelo, Raphael, Donatello, and Leonardo da Vinci. Brilliant man himself, kind of the jack of all trades. Painter, sculptor, inventor, much like Michelangelo, they're kind of rivals in a sense. Uh, da Vinci produced such powerful works as the Mona Lisa in 1506, which are to Historians and critics are still debating today what it meant, all the details on it, 500 years later. Well, he's fascinated by science and natural world. Da Vinci tinkered with architectural designs, plans for elaborate canal systems, a swinging bridge for river traffic, uh, and even a primitive helicopter. The plot made it work, and he understood the principles behind it. He even printed a tank. He's always experimenting with different painting techniques. Uh, the Last Supper is one of them. Um, some are more successful than others. Uh, it took three years to produce The Last Supper. It's a huge thing between 1495 and 98. Uh, it's, it's basically filled up this entire wall here, 20, 30 feet. Uh, huge thing. It's so easy to see the miniature of it. In fact, uh, it's such a compelling and iconic image that what still this day, we think of the Last Supper, that starts in the New Testament, this is the image we think of. And of course, they're all sitting around a table. It's not, everyone wants to be in the picture, get on the side of the table. <laughs> I'm not sure if you can tell it's always a good one. But, uh, but that's the image we have, is 12 men here at a table, uh, Christ in the middle. And of course, it's these Renaissance artists that have halos over holy figures and angels. They did that basically to highlight the, who's the holy figure, who is it. And a lot of these depictions here, you'll have similar uh, last summer paintings, you'll have halos around all the disciples, except Judas. Well, the last supper met with a mixed results. Uh, it resulted in numerous attempts to try to restore the painting, the last of which was completed in 1999. Basically, they had to Get rid of all the touch-ups, go back to what paint was left, and just basically store it millimeter by millimeter, uh, brush stroke by brush stroke. But still this day, just in artistic terms, remains an excellent sample of structure, scale, and religious devotion. And those are these figures that we're uh, talking about. Uh, Northern Renaissance humanism to the north of the Alps, north, pretty much in Germany. Similar ideas, but uh, more realism. Usually the, the figures aren't necessarily the uh, focal point of the picture. Basically, it's the common everyday objects. Now, like, for example, uh, 365 Van Eyck's uh, Arnolfini's Bride. Basically, the people are almost an afterthought. It's basically the focus is on everything around it. The details in the mirror in the back. For example, you actually can see the artist uh, painting it. 366 uh, Albrecht Durer's Adoration of the Magi. Basically, everything kind of broken down, but most of the detail being made to the background. Christ's child, which should be the focal point of the Italian masters, is is not the focus 
of Durer's depiction. And that's the difference between the two. Glass, we have time. Any questions, anything?